all going to find Richard if you Google for him and can drop him in another email with questions. I'm sure he's going to be happy to answer those. And so we have two minutes coffee break, enough for everybody to run to the kitchen. And now we change to Hugo. Thanks again, Richard. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, so. I will, you should be a co-host now and be able to take over the slides or the screen. Yeah, wonderful. Do you hear me? Fantastic, perfect. And do you see me? Okay, and we see you. Yes. For everybody who wondered why Andreas and I did not turn off our videos, last week Andreas found it hard to speak to a computer without seeing anybody. But Hugo said in advance, uh, he's happy to speak only into the computer, right? So we're going to turn off our videos. Okay, Hugo muted himself. Well, okay, we go. You're, you're ready, set up? Uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks a lot um, for talking in uh, this experimental seminar, um, uh, Gaussianity of body easing model. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk. Uh, I apologize in advance because I know that my connection is very bad and we are using it both uh, my girlfriend and me because she's teaching her uh, students right now. So. I hope it's going to uh, work. Uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, during this talk is uh, joint work with uh, Michael Eisenman about the Gaussianity of the 4D easing model. And this work uh, pertains to two research. Kind of what, uh, what are these two uh, perspective on the results. So the first one would be a Euclidean field theory. And it's actually what I will present in second because it's maybe the farthest away from uh, what uh, you, I mean, the, the group of people attending is, is used to. And the second uh, agenda is much more classical for us. And it's just the study of critical phenomena in statistical mechanics. So I'm gonna start with this one. So I, I don't know exactly, I mean, it's a very wide audience, so I'm pretty sure that part of the people will never have heard about. I'm going to take an example of a very classical statistical mechanics model, which is the easing model. So the statistical mechanics perspective. Okay, so the Ising model, which is by the way exactly 100 years old to I mean, this year, is a model uh, for ferromagnetism. It's defined on a subset of ZD. So think of this as a finite subgraph of ZD. And ZD in our case will be Z4 most of the time, but I still want to be defining it in general to be able to compare to other results in other dimensions. So you take a finite subgraph of ZD, 
and it's going to be um, which are assigning to every vertex of my graph spins that are plus or minus one. So our configuration will be functions from the set of vertices, which I identify with lambda, and uh, to plus or minus one. And the Hamiltonian of the configuration will be defined as minus sum of sigma x sigma y for x neighboring y. So that means that you are an edge of the square lattice. Okay, so you sum over edges minus sigma x sigma y. That gives me the Hamiltonian of the configuration that gives us Hamiltonian by defining for a random variable x the average of x, and there will be a parameter beta. The average of x will simply be one over some normalization constant, sum over every sigma of x of sigma exponential of minus beta h lambda of sigma. So the beta, you recover it here, and it's kind of telling you how much you care about the uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, so this defines for you a measure on a finite graph lambda, and I will use the notation like that to denote the limit when lambda tends to ZD of the previous measures. Here I should say for people who know a little bit more about that, I want to highlight that this is the easing model at inverse temperature beta, its nearest neighbor, it's ferromagnetic, and it's, uh, let's try to use technology just to put the delightful pictures. Well, it's a little bit, yeah. This is easing. And um, what we are interested in is the behavior of spin-spin uh, correlation, so quantities like that. For instance, how much the spin at x and the spin at y uh, uh, correlate when, for instance, x minus y is large. Okay? So, with regard to this question of how much, uh, how big the correlations are, there is a very big phase transition between different uh, behaviors. So, below this critical temperature, uh, best temperature, there is a phase which is called the disordered phase. And the phase above the beta C, which is an ordered phase. And these phases, they are characterized, if you want, by, by two things. The first one is that in the ordered phase, when I look at sigma x, sigma, let's say sigma zero, sigma x, this converges when I send x to infinity, this converges to a quantity which is equal to m of beta squared, so it's a positive and the property in the ordered phase that this quantity is strictly positive. Okay, this quantity will come back in the next slide. On the other hand, when you are in the disordered phase, when you are for beta smaller than beta c, uh, so, uh, yeah. so when beta is smaller than beta c, I see that some people have some, some problem. I hope that it's only them, but uh, I would not be surprised if it's you to me. Um, so in the also direction, could you perhaps turn off your personal video? Yes, this I can definitely do. Might make it easier. Okay. Okay, so when you are in the, in the subcritical phase, in the disordered phase, the quantity sigma zero, sigma x, in fact, decays exponentially fast. And for instance, sigma zero, sigma n e1, so if I just take a vector a unit vector and I just multiply it by n, then um, sigma zero sigma any one should behave like exponential of minus n one plus it over one. And the rate at which you converge, the exponential decay uh, holds, is character.
characterization of the disordered phase that this quantity is strictly positive and finite. Sorry, it's fine. Okay. So these are the two phases, disordered uh, ordered phase. And in fact, the quantity that we are very much interested in and the place where we are very much interested in understanding the behavior of the model is exactly what happened between these two phases. So for beta smaller than beta c and for beta larger than beta c. So what are the type, so question, what happens at and near beta c? So of course, I mean, there are different things we can uh, study in this region. The first example for, of object we could be interested in is what we call the thermal So one for instance, so for instance, we could be interested in the behavior of the susceptibility, the magnetization when beta tends to beta C. Okay, very good. I hear that people seem to be hearing better. It's perfect. So first example of quantity we could be studying on the near critical and the critical uh, regime is how these quantities that I defined before, the correlation length and the magnetization behave. That's one of the typical uh, questions that people ask. Another possible thing to take a look at is to look exactly at beta C. And for instance, to look at the two point uh, correlation function. So what do I do in this case? I'm interested in, be, in uh, studying sigma zero, sigma x at beta c. So before notice that it was when beta tends to beta c, now it's at beta c. And this you predict that it's gonna behave something like that. And for instance, you could ask uh, what is eta? And here maybe I should be more. Or even These are also questions that I guess many of you encountered when you study critical regime of a model. So can you compute the critical exponents of the system at criticality? Let me suggest another question, which is maybe motivated at first place by the Euclidean phase theory, but which is very natural also from the point of view of statistical mechanics, which is to study large scale averages of our, our uh, configuration sigma x. Uh, here maybe I should just think of it as a configuration in ZD. What do I mean by that? Uh, x is x minus one, okay. Some people are handling the, the answer. Okay, so large scale averages, what do I mean by that? Imagine that I give myself a function and let's say it's a continuous function and it's bounded support, okay? And uh, let's define the average of sigma at scale L. L will be an integer. Think of a large integer. And define the average of the thing by uh, doing the following sum for x in zd, f of l times x, uh, sorry, f of x divided by l times sigma x. Okay, so this is a, a function. It's well defined because notice that uh, here, this f is zero outside of the box of, uh, outside of a certain box, so it's a finite sum, so we can perfectly make sense of this quantity. And since the sigma is a random variable, then the tfl of sigma is also a random variable. Okay? And one question you can ask 
and this will be actually the main question in our uh, talk, is uh, what is the law of this uh, random variable when L is large and beta is, let's say, at beta C or near beta C. Let, let's start with at beta C. So when, okay. This is the main question. As a random variable sigma, as a random distribution, and to try to integrate it against smooth function or nice function, nice enough functions. Okay. I hope that the question is clear for everybody, and I hope one doesn't really need to uh, to motivate much more that this is an interesting question. Okay. Now. What is a theorem like that for people that are already lost, they can live having at least seen the theorem. So it's a theorem, as I said, which is due to Michael Eisen. at the end of 2019. And it says the following. It's gonna deal with dimension four. So we fix dimension four. Actually, it has implication for other dimensions, but during this talk, I will fix uh, dimension four. And uh, consider a function, as I said, finite, uh, I mean, continuous bounded support. Let's fix, fix an integer L and let's fix beta. Then, what the theorem is going to say, well, it's going to say that TFL of sigma roughly has the law of a Gaussian when L is large. So I'm going to characterize that by taking the Laplace uh, transform. So I'm going to look at this quantity at beta, where Z is uh, just a real number. And this I claim that it's equal to E to the Z squared times TFL of sigma squared at beta. So notice that this would be what it is if TFL of sigma would be exactly a Gaussian random variable of variance TFL of sigma squared, or I mean the variance of TFL. But of course, it's not exactly a Gaussian, but what the theorem is saying is that, well, it's close to be a Gaussian, in the sense that the error term has the following uh, structure like that. So CF is a very explicit function, I mean, constant depending only on F. It, it, of course, it, it has to, I mean, you have to have a function, I mean, a constant that depends on F because if you blow up F by a constant, you are going to change the variance of everything and also the, uh, I mean, you will feel the dependencies more. And uh, on the other hand, if you increase maybe the range of F, you should also kind of uh, change the constant. So there is a constant depending on F, there is a Z to the four, whatever. But the important thing is this term here. This is really the term that is saying, if L is large, then you are almost like a Gaussian. Okay, so maybe the interpretation here TFL of sigma is almost like a Gaussian of variance equal to that. And here doesn't mean it has a law, but it almost has a law. Okay. Of course, there are restrictions a little bit for this theorem. The first thing is that it's not very difficult to see that if you are not at beta c, here I just said that I'm taking beta, I didn't take beta equal beta c. If you are not at beta c, then in some sense there must be a constraint on L because it's going to be a property that is kind of typical of the critical phase. So if L is too big, and beta is not equal to beta c, for instance, beta is smaller than beta c, you don't look critical at all. Your system doesn't look critical. So here, the right condition is that you want 
that the length is smaller than the correlation length. And this correlation length is infinite at beta c, so at if b is equal to, beta is equal to beta c, there is no constant. point of view is that we need here beta smaller or equal to beta c. If you are above beta c, we need to uh, improve a little bit what we did and uh, the result was sufficiently uh, technical as it was, so uh, we, we dropped this. The last condition, and this is more a condition that you see sigma is not of definite sign, so if you average it against something which is too wide, you may have problems. Here, uh, we are taking f positive, but this also could probably be uh, circumverted, and these are not. This condition is maybe not uh, very important. This is a theorem. So, roughly speaking, the large-scale behavior of the Ising model in uh, dimension four is Gaussian. It looks like a Gaussian process. I'm not telling you what variance it has, but it's telling you that it's a Gaussian process. So, let me comment a little bit on the history of uh, this theorem. And in particular, what happens in other dimensions. So, I'm, I'm not gonna discuss dimension one because uh, I'm not easing. So let's start with dimension two. And in dimension two, I should say this theorem is wrong. So this would be wrong, meaning that if you take averages of this sort here, I mean, if you look at this thing, you will not get something that is nearly Gaussian, okay? The law is very different in particular and there are different papers that prove that the 2D easing model is not Gaussian. There is a paper by Eisenman in 82, where maybe there is the simplest proof of this fact. It's a very clever uh, combinatorial argument and very, very short. But more generally, with all the study we have on nearest neighbor ferromagnetic easing model on Z2, if you pick basically any delicate result on 2D, and you look a little bit more, you will see that you don't, I mean, that it implies non-Gaussianity. In particular, all the results on conformal invariance, they all basically implies non-Gaussianity, okay? So that's the first thing. Second thing of interest is dimension five and more. In dimension five and more, the result is right. So indeed, the process is Gaussian. So if you take large scale averages of easing in dimension five and more, it's Gaussian. And this is a very classical result by Eisenman in 82. And this is actually the same result as here. It's the same thing. And in the same year by Frölich, it's a very, I will explain as both when I will discuss the Euclidean field theory approach. And uh, what I should say is that there, the error term, the big O becomes CF Z4 divided by, and there we get a L to the D minus four. So you see, we get a polynomial decay in uh, the size L of your, in the scale L of your average, why at beta, at uh, in dimension four, sorry, you only get logarithmic uh, correction, okay? Now for the remains dimension three and there, it's also conjectured to be wrong, and there are even papers in physics nowadays that do run numerics to know how wrong it is in some sense, for instance, by looking at how far the fourth moment of the distribution is from second moment squared, I mean, from uh, three times the second moment squared. And so this is only conjectural. And it's a very nice question. 
Okay, so dimension two, it's wrong. Dimension three is expected to be wrong and dimension five and more, it's right. All these results and the conjectures are old. They are already 40 years old. So what happened in between, uh, like during these 40 years? Uh, in part, well, things that were obtained in dimension four were results that were conditional on some, some by Frodish, by Eisenman Graham, by uh, many other people. I will not make the full list, but these partial results, they were always relying on the following assumption that the correlation between sigma zero and sigma x was behaving, was much smaller than one over x squared. So if I come back a moment here, notice that I wrote the exponent like one over x to the d minus two plus eta. There is a reason is that for the easing model in dimension three and more, we actually know how to prove that in some sense, the spin-spin correlations are always bounded by one over x to the d minus two, which in dimension four gives you one over x squared. So if you assume it's actually much smaller than this constant, then you can prove Gaussianity. And there were a number of results proving that. The problem, and here I want to be very uh, uh, clear about that, the problem is that the prediction, it is predicted, that in fact it is of the order of one over x squared, meaning it's up to constant. So maybe I should use this notation. And here I meant that bit as, that it is of the order of one over x squared. So I'm fine with results that are conditional, but if they are conditional or something that we are not expecting to be true, it's, it's a little bit less uh, interesting. So here, the important thing is that we expect sigma zero sigma x to be behaving like one over x squared. So all the partial results that were before were kind of uh, inoperant in some sense. Okay, so this is of statistical mechanics. Say. Now, what happens? What, what is the second perspective on the result? So the second one is inspired and motivated by Euclidean field theory. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean the field where the goal is to construct averages that looks like that. So averages on like one of a normalization of the integral of f of phi exponential of minus h of phi product of x in r d this time of d phi x for some for some h of phi which looks like a quadratic form so for instance typically uh, what people uh, think of most of the time so uh, so this is a quadratic form and people like simply to take the integral of the gradient dx plus a second term which is going to be some kind of potential term p of phi of x dx where p this time is a polynomial. I will give you examples in a second, okay? And you want to construct this type of, so phi would be a function from uh, rd to r, so at every point there would be uh, uh, a value, and you would like to define uh, pass integrals, or I mean, integrals on this, uh, I mean, against this type of function. And the problem is that when you do that, you quickly see that you have a very heavy, like for any uh, interesting example, you have problems to define these integrals. 
it's very difficult to define these integers. So what do we do? Uh, at this stage, there is no, uh, uh, no problem of, uh, I mean, for now I don't uh, put a multiplicative renormalization, but you are gonna see there will be some. In the previous here, there is no problem of renormalization because here, this thing is gonna blow up at the right, uh, at the right speed. So if you want there, you can just define z prime to be uh, something like uh, z square root of your variance uh, divided sorry and then uh, then uh, it's the uh, square root of this and you and you will get that this divided by square root so you don't need that stage to renormalize, but this is a very good question. I'm going to recome back to that in a second. What do you do in general to uh, to the normalization? But at this stage, we didn't need one. Okay, so we have problems to define this type of integrals. So question, I mean, one thing, one way of doing is to try to discretize or to regularize our uh, objects that we are trying to construct. So let me give you one which is going to guide our, our uh, next example, which will be the relevant one for our talk. So let's start with no polynomial. P is equal to zero. And again, I'm going to take the quadratic form to be simply this thing. Okay, so here, even in this case, it's not trivial to construct the objects and the integrals that are uh, mentioned here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna discretize, I'm not gonna work on RD, but I'm gonna work on a finite subset of ZD. And I'm gonna take phi as a function the vertices of my set into R and defined F lambda to be one of the normalization times the integral of F of phi exponential. Here I'm gonna put something just because we are probabilists, but this, is, uh, this constant is not so important. And here I'm gonna discretize, notice that this is some kind of discretization of this product over x in lambda of d phi x, where this is Lebesgue. Okay, so here, making sense of this integral is not difficult. Why? Because now it's on a finite, it's on a finite set, and everything is well defined. It's not integral. lambda, which is called the distribution, I mean, uh, measure, sorry, which is a distribution of the discrete Gaussian free field. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the main interest of this uh, first example? Well, the interest is that I can construct if you want a good function that would kind of I mean a good measure that will kind of satisfy this property by taking the limit so I started on ZD it's kind of a very poor approximation of RD so what I can try to do is to approximate RD by finer and finer lattices or another way of doing it is to define phi delta which will be phi x over delta, where this is just the lattice approximation, uh, the lattice point closest to x over delta, phi x. And I can renormalize it. And the right way of renormalizing this, this thing, 
as delta tends to zero, then this converges in distribution to an object phi, which is called the Gaussian free field. And the Gaussian free field, you saw it last week in the talk of Nathanael popping up a little bit everywhere. And this guy, in some sense, is really the object that would satisfy, I mean, this, the law of this guy would really be the object that satisfies this thing when I take P equal to zero and this quadratic form, okay? Okay, by the way, what I mean by convergence in distribution is actually gonna be the following, that Tf of phi delta, which would be by definition, say the integral over Rd of phi of x, phi delta x dx, this converges, this is a random variable and it converges. Okay, as delta tends to zero. And in some sense, the limit, you want to call the limit, the average of phi against f. And this in some sense is this f of uh, x, phi of x, dx. So you can think of phi as some kind of distribution like random distribution obtained as limit of this uh, discrete distribution that, uh, that I had. So this is a very interesting thing. But at least give me a good motive. Because if you think from the point of view of Euclidean phi theory, this case where p is equal to zero, this Gaussian case is not very exciting. It's not really uh, something that uh, the physicists, for instance, would be excited by. So what we would like to do is in some sense to introduce some nonlinear terms, something interesting. And maybe the simplest thing to try is to introduce a polynomial of quartic, with a quartic term. So if you only uh, introduce this term b x squared and you don't introduce anything else then it's very easy to be doing a similar construction as here and you also get a gaussian process i will explain to you why gaussian processes are not that interesting later on i mean from the point of view of, of this problem so just adding b x squared will not be very interesting so the next level of uh, difficulty is to add lambda x to the four Notice that if you add something odd, you may have very bad converging problem when phi becomes very negative. So let's stick to, uh, uh, to even powers. So let's try to define and still this. So the quadratic form is still the same. Okay, so you can play the same game. Define exactly the same object except that instead of having sum of phi x minus phi y squared, well, you could add, which I mean, usually you define, okay, let's me write it like that. So instead of having this quantity, which was what I, uh, what I had here, like in the exponential, I had a Hamiltonian here that was this, Instead of having that, I can add a second term, which is gonna use, I mean, which is gonna correspond to a discrete version of my polynomial term, the integral of P of phi of x dx. For some reason, people here in this context prefer to, okay, this is a failure, prefer to, not a bit, to denote a beta here, which is not necessarily equal to one over 40. So imagine that now I define exactly the same as here, the same type of measure, but here I, I put this other uh, Hamiltonian, okay? There is no problem with defining this. I mean, this quantity is perfectly well defined. This uh, give me with uh, 
this provides me with some measures which may be in order not to And this measure is a perfectly well uh, defined object. And I can try again to do limits to take phi x as a kind of discrete, I mean, as a, so let's say I take, uh, maybe, maybe first thing that I'm gonna do, sorry. Here, I'm gonna take the limit as lambda tends to zd. And now I can try to play the same game as here and try to discretize, renormalize, and try to take the limit and see whether I can construct something which is more interesting than Gaussian free field. More exciting than Gaussian. Different than lambda b, which would be something like that, and on delta, where this has the same law as this. And maybe to allow ourselves some freedom, remember that here we kind of renormalize. So here I'm also going to allow myself to renormalize by an epsilon. Okay, so I have like a random variable here, which is expressed in terms of this random variable that I define, and there is tons of parameters I can play with. So hopefully, I'm going to manage by making these parameters converge in some smart fashion. I'm going to manage to construct a good, uh, interesting limits. Well, the theorem that we proved with uh, Michael Eisenman from the same paper is, in fact, an impossibility theorem. It's kind of saying there is no way to take a smart limit of the object uh, before. So for d equal four, at least in, of course in dimension four, sorry. Any convergent sequence, so imagine I, I manage to tune my parameter I managed to tune my parameter so that this converges. Well, con then, unfortunately, the limit will be a generalized Gaussian process. So what, what is, does it mean? It means that all the averages will be Gaussian random variables, okay? So as a distribution, it's a Gaussian distribution. So there is no way you can take limits and here, maybe I should be a little bit careful that there are very mild assumptions on what you're allowed to do. And it's not very surprising. It kind of come from similar assumptions at what we had before. So I mean, parameters that need to be smaller than uh, certain critical parameters and so on. But again, this morally speaking, this is, a, this is what the theorem says. So let me comment now on this theorem. So notice that what, I mean, if you place yourself from the point of view of statistical mechanics, the theorem was kind of a positive theorem. You managed to describe the scaling limit of your model, at least the scaling limit of large scale averages. From the point of view of Euclidean field theory, this is kind of a no-go theorem. It's a very negative result. And the reason for that, so it's kind of negative result. And the reason is the following, is that there is a famous result by Osterwalder and Schrader that explains how from a distribution, I mean, something which would have One can use by and something I definitely don't want to enter into details here. One can produce quantum field theories. 
and interesting quantum field series as soon as the process is not Gaussian. So the Gaussian processes, they are going to correspond on the quantum field series side to trivial uh, field series, meaning field series that do not describe, I mean, that describe uh, particles that do not interact with each other, which from the point of physics is not interesting. So you would like to construct generalized, uh, I mean, uh, random distributions that will not be Gaussian. That would be your goal. And the problem here is that in dimension four, if you start from maybe what is the simplest possible uh, alteration to Gaussianity, like to the quadratic form, which is you take a polynomial, which is quartic, if you do that and you discretize, you never end up with something which is not Gaussian. So it's kind of saying that this object here, when you take P to be uh, quartic, this object here, like if you try to, uh, to define these things, you end up with something Gaussian, in fact. So the because if you try to do quantum field theory, you want to be in dimension four because you will have three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. It's a dimension of the Minkowski space. So dimension four was the most, sorry, was the most uh, interesting dimension from from the point of view of this uh, Euclidean uh, field theory. In fact, there are, uh, I mean, here I'm not uh, going to have time to tell you more about it, but there are uh, a bunch of, I mean, there, there was a whole uh, uh, field of uh, mathematical physics, which was devoted to try to construct this phi-4 continuous field from lattice phi-4 or from uh, discretization of phi-4. There are other ways of, uh, of doing discretizations, I should say. And it was a very successful field in dimension two and three, exactly like we said that for the Ising model, you do not end up with something Gaussian, where there they did manage to end up with non-Gaussian field in the limit, which was very interesting. And in 82, arrives this result of Eisenman and Frölich, which is kind of exactly saying, well, here, if I do dimensions strictly larger than four, any limit is Gaussian. And this started to say, okay, hold on, maybe we are not going to manage by discretizing phi four to construct a non trivial field theory. But it was only in dimension five and more, which, is, which are not really physically interesting dimensions, at least from this point of view. So dimension four was really the dimension where you needed to prove something. Okay, let me also make a bridge between uh, the two sections, and then I will try to tell you in two minutes why dimension four is important. Why is it dimension four? So before that, two more comments, as I said. First comment is that if lambda is equal to zero, then you are Gaussian, right? This I said already, if here you, put, you, you don't put that, then you get something Gaussian anyway. On the other hand, if lambda is equal to minus b over two and tends to plus infinity, the lambda phi x to the four plus b phi x squared becomes lambda phi x squared minus one squared plus constant. And notice that this, if lambda goes to infinity, it starts to force your field phi x to be either plus one or minus one. So you end up with the easing model. So in some sense, this model that I introduce here, they interpolate between the easing model on one side when and and it happens that when b beta are fixed and lambda is very small so in some sense if you start close to the gaussian free field then it happens there that there were result describing very well I mean, in, in, with a lot of precision, the possible scaling limits. So the names there are Gavetsky, Kutpi, Einen, Bauer, Schmidt, Bridges, Slade, uh, 
uh, heart attack. Yes, there, there was a, a lot of, uh, of results. Just, I want to finish, I'm, I'm going to stop this discussion here and, and just finish on one thing, which is maybe, I mean, why D equal four, right? What is so special about dimension four? And let me just say that if you want to have something Gaussian, one thing you could try to look at is to look at U4 of X, Y, Z, T, which is kind of measuring how far sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, sigma T is from the weak law. So another way of determining what is, uh, 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 I mean, how you characterize a Gaussian process is to say it satisfies the weak law. So here you could look at sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, sigma T, and you subtract the two other pairings that you can do, and you try to measure this thing. If it's a Gaussian pro process, this is zero. If it's not a Gaussian process, it's non-zero. And in particular, what you could hope is to be able to prove that this term is much smaller than than this one, for instance, or than this one or any of those. So to say that ap approximately U4 is zero. And it happened that U4 has a very nice rewriting. One can rewrite U4 in a very nice fashion for the easing model. You can rewrite it as minus two, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, sigma t, times a process which roughly speaking, I'm gonna denote like that, where this is kind of the law of, so it's the law of two independent non-Markovian, this is going to be very important, but let's forget that. non marking and random walks. One that goes from X to Y. And one that goes from Z to T. Let's use another color. And what the, re the rewriting here says is that here, U4 is minus two times the product of the spin-spin correlations times the probability if you sample an independent random work for x to y and one from z to t, you sample them independently, the probability is that they intersect. Imagine for a moment that this thing are just laws of just simple random work. That it's not a non-Markovian process, it's actually a simple random work. Well, it's very classical that if you take a simple random work from X to Y and simple random work from Z to T, and let's say these four points are roughly a distance capital L of each other, then the intersection probability is gonna be positive uniformly in L when you are in dimension two and three, so this quantity here would be positive and will not tend to zero. It's very classical that it decays like one over L to the D minus four in dimension five and plus and, and, and more. And that then means that this quantity here is gonna be much smaller than this one, which is exactly kind of saying it's approximates Gaussianity. And in dimension four, well in dimension four it's also known that it's going to zero, but it's much more delicate and it's going to zero as a power of log. And this is exactly the L to the D minus four and the one over log to the C that we had before. Now, what is the catch? Well, the catch is there, is that this is non-Markovian random work. So you can rewrite the spin-spin correlation of the Ising model, but in terms of very non-Markovian random work. So what you need to prove is you need to prove non-intersection properties of this non-Varkovian random work. So here you have a lot of probabilistic uh, work to be able to uh, understand the, the stochastic behavior of this non-Markovian random works and to prove that in dimension four they do not intersect. And if you prove they do not intersect, it implies Gaussianity in fact. I think that's the last thing I wanted to say, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hugo. 
Um, so now let's try again. Applause coming from several people. So questions either in the chat or raise your hands. Actually, you could also just unmute yourself and ask the question. Somebody is brave enough. <laughs> yeah, I think I scared everybody. I'm trying to find. Just for curiosity, because one. Okay, so I, there is a question. I found a question. Uh, is there a similar pass representation for five? It's a very, very good question. And actually, um, there are two ways of doing it. So, so uh, question Is there the, uh, this uh, random walk representation for five? -fold? for this 5-4 lattice model that I, uh, that I defined. Um, so, yes, the answer is yes. It's just that if you look directly at the representation, you are gonna miss one technical thing, which is, um, it's important in fact in the, I mean, there is a technical tool I didn't describe. I mean, we have this non-Markovian random walks, so this is bad for you, but the good news is that these non-Markovian random books, they come with a, a tool. And this tool is called the switching lemma. And the problem is that the random walk representation, the Bridges, Foley, Spencer, or Siemensic random walk representation of the correlation of phi four, unfortunately, they don't satisfy the switching lemma. So in some sense, the main I mean, to summarize the main technical tool that we are going to use is not satisfied. So how do we get the 5-4? Because we do get the 5-4. Uh, we get the 5-4 by using the Griffiths-Simons representation of 5-4. What does it mean? It's 5-4 can be rewritten as a limit of uh, easing models. And these easing models, they are strange models where every vertex of the lattice is replaced by a complete graph and you choose smartly your uh, correlations. Once you do that, you end up with easing models. So you can run the proof for these easing models. And if you do the proof properly, and it requires a little bit of care, then all the constant and the bounds that you get, get uniform in these easing models. So in particular, it passes to the limit and you get the result for FIFO. So to answer your question, yes, uh, there is a rep direct representation. Unfortunately, we don't have a switching, a direct switching lemma. But what we can do is we can approximate the phi four by easing models, and prove the result for these approximations uniformly in this approximation and take the limit. So that was for the first question. Okay, we have some more. Perhaps you go up to Gadi. I think that's the yeah. one. So Gadi. Um, so the result does cover, uh, so the second question is, um, is can we take L approximately of, uh, of size psi of beta basically? Because indeed, uh, I think what uh, Gadi has in mind is that if you take L much smaller than the correlation length, then you expect to have similar limits as what you get at beta C. So if you take L much smaller than psi of beta, uh, I mean, beta and L much smaller than psi of beta. Uh, this is this was supposed to be a beta, sorry. Well, it's basically the same as taking the limit at beta C and L, but it's not the case. It's not the case when you take L of this order, but the theorem works the same. So the theorem does tell you that the limit is Gaussian also in this case. I should be very, I mean, maybe here it's a good point uh, to, to, to warn people, is that when I mean Gaussian, I don't mean Gaussian free field. I mean Gaussian, really, it's a Gaussian process. So I don't know the covariance of this process. So what is expected is that when you take this type of limit, so you fix beta C and you take L goes to infinity, you expect to really get Gaussian free field. That's a prediction. If you take the limit like that, 
So if you take L, which is a lambda psi of beta, and you tell this to infinity, then you should get a massive GFF. But here, we are really proving just that there is a covariance if you want. We don't identify the covariance. So from our point of view, L much smaller than the correlation length of, or L of the order of the correlation length doesn't change anything for us. It doesn't change. Can one say anything if P is some power series? Um, actually, in our case, we have, so I mean, the questions, it seems guys like you just ask the question in order, it's kind of perfect. Um, I mean, the family of polynomials that we can treat. So we are not even able to treat any polynomial there. So that should be, uh, uh, I mean, there, it's really, uh, there are even polynomials of degree six that we cannot cover. I think that in any case, uh, all these things should, uh, should be uh, doable, but as for now, uh, we don't have uh, a treatment of that. Does uh, D equal four intuition for you also give a proof of Gaussianity in a high dimension? Yes, in fact, uh, the proof that we do is an improvement on the proof of eisenman frelich So the eisenman frelich proof is relying on what we call a tree diagram bound, which is something where we bound U4 of X, Y, Z, T. We bound it, so in, in the 80s, uh, Michael and, and uh, Jörg bound it by this quantity. Uh, sigma y, sigma u, sigma z, sigma u. In our case, we actually improve on that. So in some sense, our result would not uh, improve the result of, uh, of uh, of uh, Eisenman and Frolich because they don't even need this improvement. And our improvement is that here, we add the following quantity, which is called the truncated bubble diagram. It's a sum for x in the, uh, for u in the box of size L of sigma zero, sigma x squared. The important thing is that if you take this bound, and that sigma, sigma like one over x squared, you exactly get that this thing is, I mean, the, the bound is exactly of the wrong order. It's exactly giving you of the order of sigma zero, sigma, um, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, sigma t. So it doesn't improve. But if sigma zero, sigma x is of order one over x squared, then what you end up here is that the bubble diagram is logarithmic. And that's exactly what gives us this improvement. Sorry, there is a C here that I forget. So in this improvement, this improved tree bound makes it that if the spin-spin correlation behave like the green function, then the bubble diagram behave logarithmically, and it implies that U4 is much smaller than uh, than spin-spin uh, correlation. Uh, than, yeah, than spin-spin correlation. Okay. So, um, a little bit down to Lurie next. Lurie, what allow you to achieve the, the oh, result? So I, I really so think that, yeah, the, 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 the main thing is really this, this switching lemma here. And this switching lemma is gonna be uh, something that depends very much on the plus minus symmetry of our model, plus minus symmetry. So if you take all the model with this plus minus symmetry, you, you hope to be able to do the same. The problem is that you, except for easing, you don't have an exact switching lemma. So even phi four with uh, n large, I mean, where, where the spins are valued in Rn instead of R, this we don't know how to do uh, as for today. Then, uh, can you comment on the value of C in the log? Okay, so what we get is not, uh, um, it's not uh, the right C, exactly like we don't manage to get that it's the 
Gaussian free feed, really. We get a Gaussian, but we don't manage to get that it's a Gaussian free feed. So we don't get the right C, and our C is terrible. The conjecture for C, I'm always confused. I always forget. Maybe it's equal one. Maybe I don't remember exactly. It's not the same as simple random walk and loop erase random walk. Uh, Franco. Uh, ah, that was an answer to Ariel. And how do you manage without knowing beta critical? Um, okay, so in fact, there, there will be different arguments, of course. I mean, I cannot run through the argument, but one thing that uh, you have is this is a I'm moving my hands for now an hour, just in front of a computer that doesn't want to see me. Anyway. Um, so a question that is asked to probabilists quite often is how can you prove something on criticality when you don't know what criticality is, for instance? And your question is kind of the next question, which is how can you do it when you are not even at beta critical? But if, I mean, the thing is that beta critical is defined implicitly, right? It has a property, so you can deduce things at criticality. So for instance, some things that you can deduce for the easing model, at criticality is that it's smaller than one over x squared, I mean, d minus two. This was uh, the thing that I told you that in some sense, the eta here is always positive. Uh, I should not uh, erase it, but uh, it just says that it's positive. And another bound that you can do is that you can always prove that it's larger than d minus one here. So you have like polynomial decays of the spin-spin correlations. And in fact, this extends to beta as long as beta, uh, as, uh, sorry, as x is smaller or equal to uh, psi of beta. And uh, beta is smaller than beta c, otherwise you have to truncate. I mean, that's not a big problem, but so, you don't know what beta is, you don't know if you're exactly at beta c, but using this type of quantity, this type of information, you can still prove things. That was actually one of the big difficulties in our, uh, in our uh, paper was that you need somehow in this regime to be able to say things like uh, sigma zero, sigma two x, is kind of a little bit smaller than sigma zero, sigma x by like a multiplicative factor, but not much more than that. I mean, we had exactly this type of issues where you need to extract as much juice as possible from the fact that you know that you are below the correlation length, basically. But you can get information from below the correlation length. Um, uh, can you give a characterization of the non-Markovian random work that you invoke in the argument for Goshenit? Uh, I mean, this, this process, are actually, they are not even really works. They are uh, traces of what we call random currents. Uh, it would be a little bit too long to define these things, but I, I encourage you to, to look at the introduction of the paper. It's not, uh, I mean, the, the objects are defined there. Um, and they are really something that you can always pop up from, uh, let's say, from the, um, the plus minus symmetry. It's really uh, uh, these random currents come from this plus minus symmetry of the spin space. Uh, Tom, is the improved bound with the bubble diagram you just wrote down valid in all dimensions? Yes, it is uh, valid in all dimension. Um, and we don't know what to do uh, with it. <laughs> But uh, yes, yes, it is valid in, uh, in any dimension. Are there other questions? Well, if not, I but thank you all. Again, yeah. well, um, this was interesting, like uh, uh, next experiment, how to give these talks. So upstream capacity should be strong enough obviously. Um, thank you very thank much you very for much. showing your experiment. Thanks for everybody um, tuning in. Andreas, do you want to say something to wrap up? Uh, just to wrap up, please go to the website. You can see more information about forthcoming talks. Also, for those of you who are new tuning in this week, we have 
an email that goes out once a week. If you want to subscribe to that email, please go to the web page and the information about how to subscribe is on the web page. Other than that, Life's turned off his video, so that indicates that we seem to have reached the end of the seminar. He's turned it back on again. Thank you very much for um, our both, both of our speakers. Thank you much, very much for tuning in, and we'll see you the same time and the same place next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. That's all. So the channel remains open for another hour or so. So if somebody wants to continue discussing in the chat, uh, don't worry, you're not kicked out soon. Hello. Hello. Yeah.